Greetings, guys. Good friend Gospel here. Gospel to the Geek. And this episode is about handicaps. But what is a handicap? Now, a circumstance that makes progress or success difficult. We typically don't like it when things are made more difficult for us. However, we find it entertaining when others handicap themselves for our sake. So I am giving myself a handicap for the sake of your entertainment. See, I believe that all creation points to Jesus, all of it, even man's creations. And since this channel is about preaching Christ through creations like comics, I wanted to find a comic book character that most would think cannot point to Jesus, yet somehow use that character to point to Christ. Which is why I scoured the internet for some unheard of comic book hero to do this with. And let me tell you, it wasn't an easy task. Intentionally so. You see, the most popular characters are too easy. Superman? Literally a Christ figure. Wonder Woman? A literal god who has a lasso that can reveal objective truth? Next, Wolverine. Immortality? Blade? Using what may be perceived as evil as something for good? So I went to the Indies the really obscure ones, and boy did I find the weirdest superhero out there. And as you've already seen the thumbnail of this video, this superhero's name is Foreskin Man. And I will use Foreskin Man to point to Christ. So who is Foreskin Man? Foreskin Man is the alter ego of scientist playboy billionaire Miles Hastwick, curator of the Museum of Genital Integrity by Day, and defender of kids the world over, also by day. According to the book's official webpage, Miles' motivation to become Foreskin Man was, quote, society's failure to protect its most vulner vulnerable citizens, <laughs> end quote. By means not given us by the writer, Miles acquired or most likely developed technologically advanced plasma boots. These sound pretty amazing at first. But then, you quickly realize that Foreskin Man only uses them for flight. I mean, flying is nice and all, but I feel like the potential to use them the way Suna does with his X-Gloves in Reborn was really overlooked on this one. Would have been cool to add energy projection to his list of abilities, but alas, he only uses them to fly. Although he does use them one time to burn off some rope. With these boots, he flies around fighting crime, and I quote, by hunting down criminals who cut off the genitals of innocent boys. Okay. Fighting alongside him in his crusade of genital integrity is the Nigerian superheroine Volvo Girl. I wish I was making this up. Unlike him, she has actual magical superpowers, unrelated to her female parts by the way, yet for some reason that is beyond my understanding, she goes by that name. Not to be outdone, the villains in this comic are equally weird, if not even weirder. First off, we have the obviously greedy corporate CEO. You know, the ones that make money off selling the tissue of excised foreskins. Yep. A doctor who hawks out every time he sees an uncircumcised boy. Creepy. A knife that gives anyone who holds it an uncontrollable urge to circumcise little boys. And this. The monster moho. Yeah. Now, if you're thinking that this character was created by a politically motivated writer, then you thought right. Foreskin Man was created by this dude, Matthew Hess. This comic book was created for the purpose of promoting a bill that would prohibit male genital mutilation, aka circumcision. Hess is a member of an intactivist group. Get it? Intact? Activist? Intactivist? Their goal was not only to end circumcision in the US, but across the whole globe. Which is why in this comic, you see foreskin men beating people up in Turkey, Nigeria, and even in the Philippines. Not only does he illegally beat these people up by the way, he also straight up kidnaps their children. Here in the second issue, foreskin man is attempting to save a child from the monster mohel during the kid's bris or Jewish circumcision ceremony. 
During the ensuing chaos, the child's mother is tackled by one of the Mohel's men and is fatally wounded. With her dying breath, she tells Foreskin Man to take the child to this random person, who is also a thief and an arsonist by the way. All the while, the child's Jewish father watches helplessly as Foreskin Man snatches his son and flees the scene. I know you think this father must be evil for wanting his child circumcised, but is that reason enough to separate him from his child? This kidnapping Stendipus isn't a one-off either. In another issue, he also kidnaps this Filipino woman's kid. To no one's surprise, the comic turned out to be counterproductive to Matthew Hess's cause and to this day, no changes have been made in US legislature with regards to male circumcision. With its alleged anti-Semitic depiction of a Jewish mohel, among other things, the comic drew heat from both sides of the aisle and even put off those sitting in the middle. It even inspired this crossover with another political superhero, Captain Israel. <laughs> Yikes. So while in his fictional world, Fortskin Man seems to be making a difference, in the real world, he's only made things worse. Now, this video isn't about whether or not circumcision should be banned. This is about how Foreskin Man points to Jesus. And yes, we will come to that eventually. But first, handicaps. God loves handicaps. When God decided to pick his chosen people, he didn't go looking for a rich and powerful ruler who believed in him. God picked a total rando. Meet Abram. Super random guy that is introduced to us in the end of Genesis chapter 11. From what we can get from the biblical narrative, Abram was most likely pagan. So the Lord one day comes up to this pagan Abram fellow and tells him that the whole earth was going to be blessed through him. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and those who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed." Now Abram thinks this is a pretty sweet deal. Free lands, lots of descendants. Note that the man was 75 years old at this point and had no children. What could possibly go wrong? So he obeys the Lord and leaves his pagan dad's homeland and ventures off to this promised land along with his wife his nephew Lot, and all their possessions. On this journey, a lot of things happen, none of which was getting that son God promised him. Pharaoh falls in love with his beautiful wife, and fearing that he would get killed by a jealous Pharaoh, he tells her to lie about their relationship. Later on, his and his nephew's servants have a squabble over territory, so they split ways. They soon get reunited, however, after Lot gets kidnapped and Abram has to rescue him from the local warlord. Now at this point, Abram is getting impatient. He's fended off an Egyptian pharaoh and went to war with a warlord but still has no son. He's only growing older, and so is his wife. So the next time God's disembodied voice speaks to him, Abram proposes to the Almighty that he make his servant Eliezer his ear. God declines Abram's gracious offer, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your ear, your very own son shall be your ear. And he brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven and the number of stars if you're able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted to him as righteousness. While Abram believed an almighty being could do this, he still had some doubt whether that being would. So he asked God pretty much to put it in paper. Abram wanted a formal contract promising that God was going to give him all the stuff he was promised. And amazingly, the Lord complies. What happens next can be a little confusing if you don't know what's going on. So I'm going to go through that with you. If you want to, you can pause the video right here and read Genesis 15, 8 through 11. Done? Quite interesting, huh? What we have here is called the Covenant of Pieces or the covenant between the parts. This was an ancient Near East practice which is kind of like the ancient equivalent of what we call a contract nowadays. When two groups or people made some kind of deal, they performed this ritual to seal it. 
Both parties involved would take an animal, or a couple of them, cut them in half, and place the chopped off halves opposite to each other, creating a bloody path between the pieces. The parties involved would then walk through that path, each symbolically swearing to the other that if they ever transgressed their end of the deal, the same thing that was done to the animals could be done to them. The Covenant Breaker gave the other party the right to kill them. A more accurate description of this can be seen in Jeremiah. Those who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walked between its pieces. So basically a bloodier version of the pinky promise. Things were a bit more hardcore back then in the day. Now back to Abram. He has the animals prepared and is now waiting for God to make an appearance so that both of them can complete the covenant. However, before anything can happen, God puts Abram to sleep. As Abram groggily wakes up from his slumber, he sees two flames pass between the chopped off pieces. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. Just in case you're not familiar with the imagery, Moses, the author of Genesis, usually depicts God as a fire in his writings. The burning bush, the pillar of fire, all symbols of God, all recorded by Moses. Moses is trying to tell us in the scene that it is God who walks through the pieces. During this, God protects Abram from any consequence that might come to Abram should he break his end of the deal. Now Abram is stoked. He didn't have to walk between those pieces, so he got off clean. Plus, he now has a covenant, a pinky promise from God to give him descendants and land. However, his wife isn't quite as pleased. God didn't promise her anything, so she takes things into her own hands and forces her servant Hagar onto Abram. This was how she was supposed to get her child. Now for Abram, being a man, it was an offer he couldn't resist. So he had a child with Hagar. Abram and his wife tried to fulfill God's promise on their own. God wasn't pleased, so he visits Abram once again. He gives Abram a bit of scolding. At this point, I think it would be safe to say that Abram is really happy he didn't walk between those pieces. God then restates his covenant promise to Abram, this time changing his name to Abraham, further assuring him that he would be a father of many nations. However, God doesn't let Abraham go off easily. He tells Abraham to take a knife to his manhood. Now while we know you can have children after a circumcision, Abraham probably didn't. All he knew that he was mutilating the organ responsible for making children. Put yourself in his place. He must have thought that God was crazy. Plus, as you read on, you find out that God demanded not just him, but all his currently non-existent descendants chop theirs too. Now God is really stacking the deck against himself. But as we have learned earlier, God loves handicaps. You see, God wanted to teach Abraham and his descendants something. Abraham, in his mind, thought that it was his own ability to produce offspring that God needed to fulfill God's covenant. He thought it was his own work. And in an act of unfaithfulness, even used this ability to get Hagar pregnant. However, God wanted to make it clear to Abraham that he didn't really need Abram's help. God would do all the work. Abraham was just there for the ride. And so were his descendants. God would do all the work himself, and Abram, his descendants, and the whole world would reap the benefits of God's labor. And you know what? Abraham trusted God. In an act of supreme faith, he chops his foreskin off. This was the purpose of circumcision. It was a promise to Abraham and to his descendants. A promise that God was going to fulfill his covenant to bless the entire world through them no matter what they did, whether or not their reproductive organs were functional. So in the chapter following Abraham's circumcision, the Lord visits him once again, but this time in person, not the disembodied word, not in a fire, but in the flesh. 
in the form of a man. And during this visit, this God in the form of man gives Abraham and his wife the actual day of their son's birth. The wife is doubtful at first, but surely enough, when the time came, she gives birth to their son. In spite of her barren womb, and in spite of Abraham's mutilated manhood. At this point, Abraham has full faith in God. God promised that he would have descendants, and that very promised son was born to him. He learned firsthand that God could create life in a dead womb. His faith in God is now secure. Abraham finally becomes the father of faith. And he had so much faith, he trusted in God so much that he listened to God and obeyed him even when he was asked to sacrifice his own son. Now, any normal person would think it absurd for God to ask a parent to do this. And were this to happen to us, it should be absurd. However, Abram's case was very, very, very special. Hear me out on this one. You see, Abraham had a multi-decade spanning relationship with the Lord. He knew his voice even communicated to him face to face. The Lord proved himself to Abraham that he would be faithful to his word, and his word was that this was a promised son. Also remember that covenant of the pieces? The Lord swore on his own life that he would bless the world through this son. Which is why when God asked Abraham to do this, he didn't even hesitate. And like before, he doesn't even attempt to bargain with God. Abraham had no doubts, absolutely zero doubts, that his son Isaac was going to live past this day and have descendants of his own. So immediately, he sets out with his son and two servants. If you read the account with this in mind, you'll see clues of his confidence everywhere. When he reaches the mountain to sacrifice his child, he confidently tells the servants to wait there at the foot of the mountain, and that both himself and Isaac would return when they were done. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes up and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. He wasn't just saying this to make himself look good. He knew for a fact that they were both coming back. Another clue is when his son asks him where the sacrificial lamb was. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, and he said, here I am, my son, he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. Note that God would provide for himself. Abraham had complete faith in God that he would fulfill his own promises without any human assistance. There would be a lamb. And the Apostle Paul, writing under the pen of inspiration, wrote that even if Isaac had died that day, Abraham knew that God would raise him. By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac up as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. So in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. And lo and behold, when Abraham was about to strike Isaac, the angel of the Lord then stops Abraham, restates God's promise to him, and the rest is history. Now back to circumcision. It was a covenant from God that he would fulfill his promise to bless the entire world without Abraham's, you know, male reproductive organ and without his descendants either. He was gonna use them somehow to bring about the salvation of the entire human race without their man parts help. He was going to bring the Messiah, the chosen one, the one who would bless all nations, and he didn't need an Israelite penis to achieve this. See where I'm going with this one? The savior of mankind, the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, came into this world without the assistance of a man. Jesus came into this world immaculately conceived, born of a virgin. Literally, no penis was involved. Now, while everyone was surprised when it happened, they should have seen this coming a mile away. 
first clue was at the Garden of Eden. Even in Genesis, the first promise of the Messiah was that he was coming from the woman's offspring, not the man's. Incredibly unique, because this was a patriarchal society. Every other time lineage is mentioned, children were almost always the seed of the father, not the mother. The prophet Isaiah foretold this as well. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is God in the flesh. Remember the covenant of the pieces? Two flames walked between those parts. God stopped Abram from taking part in their ritual, and in his place, a flame walked between the parts. That was Jesus right there. The pillar of fire, the burning bush. He walked between those pieces. Jesus pinky promised to Abram that even if Abram failed to keep his end of the bargain, Jesus would still take Abram's punishment in his place. And 2,000 years after that, 2,000 years after Abram's and later on descendants' unfaithfulness, Jesus, the Son of God, the perfect Lamb of God, was sacrificed on that same mountain where Abraham was supposed to sacrifice his. The one who was sinned against was killed by the ones who sinned against him. Jesus died in Abram, his descendants, and in our place. God provided the lamb. He didn't need our help. However, Abraham's descendants became convinced that they had to help God bring about salvation. At some point in their history, their sins became so great that God, who patiently lived in their midst, in spite of their sin, had to remove his presence from his temple. You read this in the book of Ezekiel. The Israelites had profaned God's temple, became exactly like their pagan neighbors, so God left. However, in the same book, God promises that he was going to return. As the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing east, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. In a desperate attempt to hasten his return, the Jews became overzealous in the keeping of his commandments given to Moses. They even made rules of their own, somehow thinking this would increase the efficacy of calling God back. They became too preoccupied in keeping their mitzvah, or commandments, circumcision included, that they completely missed the moment God actually returned. You see, God was going to return no matter what his people did. He didn't need their help or cooperation. He loved them so much that even though he knew his own people were going to torture and kill him, he came back to them. They didn't learn from their ancestor Abraham, and to this day, some still believe the Messiah's coming is dependent on their actions. Handicap Verb To place at a disadvantage to disable or burden. God's laws are seen as a burden. Restrictions that prevent us humans from enjoying life the way we want to. A list of do's and don'ts. A handicap. God's laws are supposed to be a benefit to mankind. If kept by everyone, society will prosper. This was especially true for the Israelites. If they kept their covenant with God, then they would be able to keep their land. If they ate right, then they would be healthier than their neighbors. If they rested during their Sabbaths and allowed their servants to rest as well, they wouldn't be as stressed. If they isolated the infectious, washed their hands, and kept all their sanitary laws, then they would not be affected by the illnesses like their neighbors did. God's laws are for our own good. However, what good are laws to a criminal? Sin is the transgression of the law, and the punishment for sin is death. Sometimes we try and tiptoe through God's laws, hoping that obedience would give us good karma, or brownie points in God's eyes, and absolve us of all of our sins. But does that make any sense? When you're caught guilty for murder, can you plead innocence because you donated money to charity? 
if you're caught stealing? Will the police let you go just because you volunteer your time at the nursing home? This wouldn't even pass in our courts of justice. How much more for the court of he who is justice himself? God. The law cannot absolve us. The law cannot cleanse us. The law is a burden. But God loves burdens. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus took the burden of the law for us, kept every single dot and tittle. He lived the perfect sinless life we were supposed to, and He took its punishment for us. He paid the price for our sins on our behalf. When He walked between the parts and took the punishment for Abram, He also did that for all of us. Jesus was a promised seed of Abraham who would bless the entire world, and He blessed the world by paying for the entirety of the world's sins. Every single sin, without exception, was fully paid at the cross. All that is left for us sinners is to accept this gift. Then we are liberated, freed from the burden of having to tiptoe over God's law. Now we are able to keep the law, not out of fear of punishment, but out of gratitude. Not because we want something from God, but because He has already given us everything. We are able to experience the benefits of obedience, the benefits of keeping God's law, not because we want some form of cosmic brownie points, but because Jesus has already given us all the cosmic brownie points. Nowadays, circumcision is still performed for religious and cultural purposes. By cultures, that trace the practice all the way back to the story of Abraham in the Torah. Many of these religions and cultures even heavily recommending or requiring circumcision to belong to the group. Now while an argument can be made that this is done for health and hygienic purposes, it is plain for everyone to see that circumcision is not a health practice. It is a religious ritual. And it is a ritual that is quite honestly unnecessarily performed in a majority of cases. There is no reason for non-Jews to perform circumcision in this day and age. As a matter of fact, the disciples already settled this for us 2,000 years ago in the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. More importantly, the purpose for circumcision has already been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus already did foreskin man's work for him. Horseskin man does not need to cross borders and illegally beat people up. He no longer needs to snatch children from their parents. Horseskin man can stop his useless crusade against circumcision and instead preach the message of Jesus Christ. That for me is the best way to save society's most vulnerable citizens. Who cares if a kid's foreskin is intact if that kid is still going to die in their sins? Also. Foreskin man should get over himself. I mean, seriously, Matt Hess? M. H. Miles Hastwick? I see what you did there. You gave yourself all the ladies in the comic book, too. <laughs> I don't know what Matt Hess was hoping to achieve when he created Foreskin Man, but the way I see it, Foreskin Man has only made things worse for his cause. And this was the case for Abraham, too when he tried to produce the promised son on his own. Salvation is similar in a way. It is not something that we can achieve on our own, and oftentimes, our efforts to achieve this makes it even worse for us. We work so hard doing good deeds, looking for something in return which we don't get, and we don't feel any better afterwards. We get burnt out trying to win our way into heaven, so we just give up. It is important to realize that salvation is not something we can earn. It is a gift. It isn't something we deserve, yet God offers it freely to us. You don't have to worry about working to save yourself. That's not your job. It's God's. All you have to do, just like Abram did, is believe. God keeps all his promises, and there's no way he's going to fail. 
he experienced the worst handicap of all, death, and won. Thanks for watching this to the end of the video. I'm trying a new format now with this newfangled avatar thing, and I think it's going to make my work producing this video a lot easier. I have ideas for comic book characters like Darkseid and anime like Dr. Stone. I even have an idea for VTubers, which I kind of technically am now with this avatar. So if you're interested in any of those things, then you might want to do that thing where you click all the buttons and bells and stuff. I want to expose the gospel of Jesus Christ in geek media like comics and anime. Because in all seriousness, the gospel is for the geek. Once again, thanks for sticking around. Godspeed guys, good friend Gospel here. Gospel to the geek, gone. Bye bye!